Well, we are in a season of prayer and fasting, so I want to talk about fasting today. I know the word fast is a bad four-letter word for some of you, but I hope to change your mind today, change your opinion about that, because there's a lot of benefits that come with prayer and fasting. Jesus said in Matthew 9, some disciples, some of John's disciples came to Jesus and they said, how is it that we and the Pharisees fast often, but your disciples are not fasting? And Jesus answered, how can the guests of the bridegroom mourn while he is with them? The time will come when the bridegroom will be taken from them. He's talking about when he'd be resurrected and ascend back to heaven. And then they will fast. How many know then is now? The then that he's talking about is now. And so there seems to be an expectation by Jesus that his followers would engage in this discipline called fasting. Fasting really has always been a spiritual discipline that followers of Jesus have observed through the generations. In fact, uh, you're all familiar with the Methodist movement, the Methodist churches. Well, it was founded by a guy named John Wesley. And John Wesley fasted uh, two days a week, every Wednesday and Friday, all day. And he would not ordain a pastor into the Methodist church who did not fast two days a week, every Wednesday and Friday. Now that would leave a lot of pastors out today, including me. <laughs> but I'm working on it. I'm moving in that direction. So fasting, really it's a spiritual discipline. In fact, there's a great book, if you want to read a little bit about fasting and other spiritual disciplines, there's a book by Richard Foster called Celebration of Discipline. Anybody ever read that? Celebration of Discipline. goes through the disciplines of prayer and fasting and worship and, and, and solitude, time alone. And it's a very, very good book. I recommend it to you. But it's a discipline that seems to have gone by the wayside in our contemporary modern day Christianity. There's a lot of folks that never practice uh, prayer and fasting. You do the praying part, but the fasting part seems to get left off. So today I want to remind us of some of the reasons that the Bible says prayer and fasting is important. One of those reasons is that fasting is the process of denying our flesh, denying our body, denying our, our soul, the cravings of our soul, in order that the spiritual part of us, which is the part that's more, most like God, can, can rise up and be in control. Uh, we are three-part beings. I'm sure you all know that. We're spirit, soul, and body. So that body that uh, we're looking at right now, that's just a tent. You all know that? Yeah. It's a pretty nice looking tent. You're all looking good today. But it is just a tent. You're going to lay it aside and you're going to have another one someday when Christ returns. But how many know that the body and the soul, our mind and emotions, are in competition quite often with the spiritual part of our being? It's a competition for who is going to be in control today, right now. Who, who's going to be in charge of this life? You know, if you are uh, in one of those days when you're binging on Netflix or Hulu for six hours and, and stuffing your face with all your comfort food, who is in control? Is it your spirit or is it your body? <laughs> is it your emotions? And if we allow our, our flesh, and it's okay to, you know, veg every once in a while. I'm not, not, not saying that. But if we allow our bodies and our feelings to continually dominate us and control us, the end result's really not going to be that great for us, right? So fasting sends a message to your body and to your emotions. You are not in control here in this life. God's in control. The spiritual part of my being is in control. And Paul understood, the Apostle Paul, who wrote two-thirds of the New Testament, understood uh, the battle that sometimes we face between our, our spirit man, spirit person, and our body and our soul. In fact, he said in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 27, I discipline my body, and I bring it under subjection, lest when I have preached to others, I myself should become disqualified. I know we've all heard of many popular, well-known televangelists or authors or speakers 
who have preached to others, sometimes thousands, sometimes millions, and then they've given into some, into some kind of moral failure of some side. You know, they let their body take over, they let their emotions take over, and then now they're disqualified from further preaching the gospel. No one is immune to that possibility. Even the Apostle Paul realized that he was vulnerable to that temptation. And so he said, I discipline my body. I, I bring it under control because I don't want to be one of those folks that I, I've done my preaching and all of a sudden now I'm disqualified. I brought shame to Christ and to the body of Christ in the name of Jesus. And he says, I don't want to do that. How many are in that category? You don't want to be in that camp. But how many know this scripture doesn't apply just to televangelists? It applies to you and us. We are witnesses for Christ. Wherever we go, in the job that you are in, you are to be salt and light. You are a witness. Unbelievers are watching your life. They are observing your character, like it or not. And we don't want to preach, whether with words or with our lifestyle, and then be disqualified for giving into some carnal desire, right? Now let me just mention real quick in passing that there are, some of you might be new to this, there's basically two kinds of fasts. There is number one, a complete fast. That is where you are giving up all food and just basically drinking water or maybe juice for a period of time. It could be for one meal, it could be for one day, it could be for three days, it could be for seven days. There's a lot of people went even longer than that, 21 days. I know people that have went on a 40-day all-water fast. More power to them. Don't think, don't, don't believe I will ever do that. In fact, I'm not sure I would survive a 40-day fast. All water only. But you know, God may call you to an extended fast, or maybe it's just even giving up one meal. For some folks, that's, that's a, that, that, that alone would be a challenge. Just to give one meal and say, during that time, I'm going to seek you. I'm going to pray. And then there's a partial fast. This is where you eliminate certain kinds of food. One of the most popular partial fasts is what they call the Daniel's fast. And that's what many of us are on. And it's based on Daniel chapter 10, when the Bible says that he gave up, uh, he ate no pleasant food. So basically, he gave up meat and sweets and bread and dairy and things like that. You know, I... I I've been making some uh, veggie and fruit smoothies for some of my meals. And uh, so I put some fruit in, but I'm throwing some kale in and throwing some spinach in. And Does anybody really like the taste of kale? <laughs> Somebody's shaking your head. I don't understand it. I don't. I think it's nasty. So I mix this up, and instead of like red, like strawberries, it's green. It's this pukey color of green. I like, oh my gosh. And so I start drinking this thing, and this phrase that came out of Daniel chapter 10, he ate no pleasant food, man, that came back to my mind. <laughs> and I was in the kitchen, I told my wife, this right here, this qualifies for no pleasant food. This stuff is nasty. <laughs> but you know what? There is a lot of benefits to prayer and fasting. And I don't know about you, but I'm motivated by benefits. I want to know what's in it for me. If I'm going to get in it and do it, what's in it for me? Well, there's a lot of benefits. You know there's a lot of health benefits for fasting? I read an article that uh, cited 12 separate health benefits for fasting, including getting rid of toxins in your body, stabilizing blood pressure, giving you more energy, lowering your cholesterol, getting rid of aches and pains, and so on. So, you know, there's a lot of unbelievers, total heathens, that have discovered the power of fasting for the physical body, for your health, and they practice it all the time, and that's great. But today we are focused on the spiritual benefits of prayer and fasting, because there's a ton of those as well. This morning, I'm going to focus in on four spiritual benefits of fasting. This is not exhaustive by any means. I just picked four because that's all that we have time for. And we might not have any time for all that. But I want to focus in on these four. Number one, if you fast and pray, you will be rewarded by your Heavenly Father. Think about that. Anybody like rewards? I like rewards. That's why we shop at Fred Meyer. 
so that we can go to the gas station and we get reward points and I get, you know, money. I get uh, gas 10 cents, 20 cents, 50 cents off a gallon. However, we've got a problem in our family now. We've got a 16-year-old that is driving. And he has discovered reward points at the Fred Meyer gas station. Now, does he contribute to gaining those reward points at Fred Meyer by spending lots of money? No. No, he doesn't. But he has discovered that if he can time it just right after mom has went to the store and he can beat mom and dad to the gas pumps, then he can get the reward points. I mean, it's a tough, it's a tough world out there, I tell you. I like rewards. I heard about uh, this woman who lost her purse in the department store and she was frantically looking all over for it. Uh, it, was just during, it was during the Christmas hustle and bustle. And people just all over the place. Well, a young boy noticed her anxious face. And he walked up to her and says, Ma'am, have you lost your purse? And she said, Yes, I have. Have you found it? Yeah, I found it over in aisle 23. Here it is. Well, the woman quickly checked through the purse to see if all her belongings and her money was still there. And, and she said, Hmm, this is strange. I had a $20 bill in there, and now there are four $5 bills in there. And the boy piped up, and he says, yes, ma'am, that's right. Uh, the last time I found a lady's purse, she didn't have any change for a reward. <laughs> he, he's just trying to help her out, that's all. I do like rewards. You know, I actually got a credit card I got a credit card specifically because it gives reward points that you can trade in for airline miles. Now, what they didn't tell me was that I have to spend about $75,000 on their credit card to get a $200 round trip ticket somewhere. What a deal that is. Anybody ever discovered that? Oh, my goodness. But listen, here's the biblical truth. God is a rewarder. He is a rewarder. He likes to reward his children. Hebrews 11, 6 says, And without faith it's impossible to please God because anyone who comes to him must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who earnestly seek him. Do you believe that God exists? I hope you do because he's real. Now do you believe that God is a rewarder? I hope you do because the Bible said it's true. And it definitely is. I've experienced it. And one of the things that God rewards us for is prayer and fasting. In his famous Sermon on the Mount, Jesus said, When you fast, don't look somber as the hypocrites do, for they disfigure their faces to show others that they are fasting. They were just trying to get the accolades of men. Truly, I tell you, they have received their reward in full. That's all that was coming to them, whatever accolades that they could get from other people saying, hey, what a, what a pious, disciplined, righteous person you are. That's all the rewards that they were going to get. But Jesus went on to say, but when you fast, put oil on your head and wash your face so that it will not be obvious to others that you are fasting, but only to your Father who is unseen. Now listen to this part. And your Father who sees what is done in secret, will reward you. He will. I know fasting isn't easy. Your body's going to grumble and complain. Your emotions are going to throw a fit. You're going to be snippy and not too nice. And part of it, particularly during the season when you're detoxing. You're getting rid of all the junk, all the toxins that you've been putting in your body. There's a period of time, two or three days when you're detoxing. And, and you're probably not very fun to be around during that time. But if you persist and you're doing it for spiritual reasons and you're doing it to seek God, then I want to tell you a time will come when rewards will be flowing from your heavenly Father into your life. You can count on it. You can, you can take it to the bank. Now here's the second benefit, direction for your life. Fasting will bring direction. One of the most asked questions that I get is, Pastor, how can I know the will of God for my life? I, I, I don't know God's will. I want to know what direction that he wants me to go. And one of the ways you can, you can 
tap into God's will for your life is through prayer and fasting. When the Apostle Paul was a younger Christian, like I said, he wrote two-thirds of the New Testament, powerful, mighty man of God. But when he was a younger Christian, he's just like you and I, really. Uh, he was seeking God's direction for his life. And so he got together with some other believers, and they began to worship and pray and to fast. And in Acts chapter 13, this is what it says. While they were worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, Set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work that I have called them to. And after they had fasted and prayed, they placed their hands on them and sent them off. People say all the time, well, I just can't hear God. I pray, I try, but I just can't hear God speak to me. Here's my question to you. Do you create an atmosphere where it's easy for the Holy Spirit to speak to you? Where it's easy to hear what he's saying? I believe God's speaking to us all the time. But it just goes over our head. We're too distracted. Our minds are filled with clutter and noise. Mental debris is just floating through our brains all the time. And we are missing what the Holy Spirit is saying to us because the Bible said the Holy Spirit, when he speaks to us, is not a loud, obnoxious voice. The Bible said it's a still, quiet whisper. So we got to get quiet enough to hear what the Holy Spirit is saying to us. You know, there's several... FM stations, frequencies that are floating through this room right now. But you can't hear them unless you have an FM receiver, number one, and then you dial into the frequency where the little red light comes on. You know you're right on the frequency. And if you got a receiver and you got some speakers, then you can hear. God has given us a spiritual receiver. By which we can hear the voice of the Holy Spirit. If you are born again, you have that receiver. It's called your spirit. Now, you had a spirit before you were born again, but it was dead. It was dead to Christ. But when you got born again, you received Christ. Your spirit was made alive. The Bible says you are a new creation in Christ Jesus. Old things have passed away. All things have become new. Man, you are a brand new creation. One version says you're a species who never before existed. And so now, you, your spirit is a receiver that can tap into the voice of the Holy Spirit. Now the only thing required is that you got to dial into the frequency. How do you do that? It's called prayer and fasting. And worship. And reading the Bible. There's more than one way to hear God's voice. But prayer and fasting is a big one. And that's what Paul and, and Barnabas and the rest did in Acts chapter 13. They, they set aside, he said, it's more important to me, is what they were saying, to hear God's voice than to feed my belly right now. And sometimes we just got to get serious with God. Sometimes I wonder how serious we are. And if we get serious, we're, we're going to dial in through prayer, fasting, and worship and we're definitely going to throw in the fasting part because that's going to declutter our minds. And fasting, by the way, it's not going to do any good if you fast food, but you fill your mind with all kinds of negative uh, or even worldly clutter. That's why I encourage people doing this prayer and fasting, get rid of most of the entertainment. Get rid of most of the social media. I mean... I know, that's good. you're going to go through withdrawals, I can tell you that. Talk about detoxing your body, you're going to detox your mind. Your emotions are going to cry out, I need entertainment! Where's my Netflix? Where's my Hulu? Where's my Facebook? I'm going to die without it. No, you're not going to die. You're going to declutter your mind so you can hear God. That's what you're going to do. And when hearing God gets more important than any kind of entertainment or social media that you can put in your brain, then you will hear God. It just depends on how, how important it is to you and how serious you are about hearing him. You know, when you read through the passages on fasting in the Bible, and I read through a lot of them this week, the folks were serious about hearing God. I'm going to mention a couple of them, but many times their life was on their line. They needed to hear God. 
And Jesus said, when he was fasting and he was tempted to eat, he said, man lives not by bread alone, by physical food, but we live by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. I can't get alone, get along just with bread alone. I've got to hear God. Now that means getting into the word of God, but sometimes we need to hear God about specific direction in our life. Does anybody need to hear God about anything? I don't know, maybe you're seeking God like Paul did about the next steps in your ministry. Maybe you're wondering if I should marry this person, if I should uh, go into business, and, and you've got the next steps in front of you. You've got life decisions in front of you. There, there's a path, there's a, a, a branch in the path, and I can go this way or that way. Which way do I go? Well, you're going to rely on your own natural ability. The Bible warns against that. Lean not on your own understanding. But trust in the Lord with all of your heart. We need to hear God. Marilyn Hickey uh, is a well-known Bible teacher and author. She's had a TV show uh, for years now, written lots of books, had uh, just conducted large crusades all over the world, really. I, I love listening to a great Bible teacher. But when she's 42 years old, she's 88 years old now, and still preaching the gospel, still on TV, still, I just noticed recently she was taking some crusade down to uh, South America or some 88 years old. But when she was 42, uh, she was just ministering primarily in her, her local church and then going out and doing some retreats, things like that. And she was at a women's retreat in Minnesota. And uh, there were so many ladies that signed up that they had to split it off into two different retreats. So she had a two-day retreat. She had a day in between. And then she was going to do the next retreat. So during that day, it was just a beautiful setting in Minnesota. There was forests and lakes and everything around. And she made a decision that she was just going to fast and pray. She felt in her heart that she was doing some good things for God. But she also felt, she just had this sense on the inside that God had something more. And she did not want to miss that. She said, God, I'm going to set aside this day. I'm going to fast and pray and seek you. So she walked in the forest and the lakes and just, just sought God and prayed and spent time with him. And got into the word and began to read. She was reading through Isaiah. And she came upon Isaiah chapter 11 verse 9. And the scripture, the scripture says this, the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. God spoke to her out of this scripture, which was written 2,700 years ago for another group of people, but God pulled it out and made it a rhema in her heart. You know what a rhema is? It's where God takes the Logos word, the written word, and makes it alive and real to you. It's a now word for you. And he took that word out, and he says, I have called you, Marilyn, to cover the earth with my word. And so what God did was launch her out of just that little ministry in her church into a worldwide ministry that she has been pursuing for the last 40 some years. But it only came, she heard, she would have never stepped out on her own. The only reason she stepped out is because she heard the Holy Spirit say, this is what I want you to do. This is the direction that I have for you. We need God's word when it comes to the decisions and the directions of our life. You don't want to miss God's best for you. If you're a single person you'd like to get married, don't marry the first Joe Blow that comes along and wants to take you out to dinner and give you a gift and give you a flower. No. Seek God. Say, God, I want your best for my life. Because you don't know how that person is going to flow with you. You don't know if they're two, two days or two years down the road that they're going to be following Jesus. Or are they going to take you away from Christ? I've seen that so many times and it breaks my heart where you got one person who is passionate for God. I'm thinking about this couple right now, a number of years ago. Man, he was so passionate. I remember he came down to the front here and, and responded to an altar call. And we prayed. He got filled with the Spirit. He was weeping before God. He was just pouring out his life. He was so excited for God. But he had a wife who was not interested in the things of God. She didn't want him to go to church. She didn't want all that religious fanaticism. And so slowly she began to pull him away, pull him away. And to this day, I don't think he's been in church for the last 10 years. Isn't that a tragedy? You don't want to miss God. 
You want to hear God. He knows what's best for you. Father knows best, right? Here's the third benefit of fasting. Favor to achieve your goals and destiny. Favor. Maybe the idea of favor isn't a big deal to you, but it's huge in the Bible. Favor is when people are inclined to help you and they don't even know why. They, they just bend over backwards to help you. To help you achieve your goals. To help you get where you're going. To help you get what you want to get, what you need to get. There are times when you need favor in life. You need favor to help get you out of a problem and a mess that you're in. You need favor to make advancements in your life or achieve some goal that God has placed in your heart. I want to give you two examples from the Bible, and there's many more. One is Nehemiah. Nehemiah had a God-given dream to rebuild the walls of Jerusalem that had been burned down when Jerusalem had been destroyed by an invading army and the Jews had been taken captive. And here, Nehemiah was serving in the courts of this foreign king uh, that had taken the Jews captive. And uh, he had a high office. He was a cupbearer. Uh, it was a coveted office, a high office that he was serving. And God had lifted him. How many know God can raise you up no matter where you are? No matter what your job you're in or what situation you're in. God can raise you up, and that's what he did. But yet he had this, this burning desire, this God-given dream to return to Jerusalem, rebuild the walls and, and the gates, and to restore Jerusalem to its original glory for the glory of God. God had put that on his heart. It didn't come out of his own mind. God had put that on his heart. And so, here he was serving in the courts of the king, and this was going to take months to restore and rebuild the tabernacle or rebuild the walls and the gates. And so he was going to need to ask a favor from the king. He was going to need to go to the king and say, hey, king, can I get several months off my job so I can go back to my homeland that you once destroyed and took us all captive, and, and start rebuilding that thing. Now, there is no reason on earth that that pagan king would have any desire or inclination to let him go back and do that. And so Nehemiah knew that if that was going to happen, he was going to need favor from that king. God was going to have to work on his heart. And so what did Nehemiah do? The Bible said in Nehemiah chapter 1 that he wept, he prayed, and he fasted. Yeah, he threw in the fasting because he was serious. He was serious about hearing from God. He was serious about getting favor from God. And then after he fasted and prayed, he concluded his prayer with these words. He said, this is Nehemiah 1.11, give your servant success today by granting him favor in the presence of this man. And with much fear and trepidation, he approached the king and he asked for this time off, can I go back and, and rebuild? Bottom line, skipping a lot of the story. But not only did the king let him go, but he gave him protection on the way there. And it was quite a journey. And there was armed bandits and everything else along the way. He gave him protection on the way. And then also released to him all the materials that he needed to get the job done. He says, my, my forest, the cedar, everything that you need, the, the stones, the quarries, it's all yours. Just help yourself, whatever you need. How many think that's favor? How many want to walk in the favor of God? Where total heathens are inclined to help you. Get where you need to go. Here's another example, Esther. Esther found herself in a desperate situation where she needed favor. Esther, if you don't know the story, was an orphan girl who was raised by her cousin Mordecai. And as she grew into adulthood, she became a beautiful, beautiful young woman. The Bible says very, very beautiful in, in face and in form. She was a 10 all the way. And a time came where the king got uh, upset with the queen, kicked her out, and he went on a search to find a new queen. And it was quite a process. They brought women in, and there was a whole year process of beautifying them, pure, you know, all the stuff that you ladies go through, you know? Perfume and face lotions and, and baths and all the stuff you put on your face, all that stuff. Well, they went through all that because they had to be perfect when they came before the king. And Esther was chosen. 
as one of those that was prospective uh, queen, and as they all came before the king, he said, no, not that one, no, not that one, no, not that one. And then Esther came and said, yeah, this one. I like this one. And he made Esther the queen. Now, nobody knew that she was a Jew. Mordecai had, had advised her not to make that known. Now, later in the story, there was a, a man named Haman who hated the Jews. And he devised a plot to exterminate, execute all the Jews in the nation in one single day. Just going to wipe them, wipe them all out. How I many you know that's a serious situation? So Esther responded by calling a fast. In Esther chapter 4, verse 15, it says, Then Esther sent this reply to Mordecai, Go, gather together all the Jews who are in Susa, and fast for me. Notice it was a corporate thing. When just who, whoever feels like it, whoever feels led <laughs> to do it. No, get them all together. Every single Jew, and let's fast. Fast for me. Do not eat for, or drink for three days, night or day. I and my attendants will fast as you do. And when this is done, I will go to the king, even though it's against the law. And if I perish, I perish. And what was she talking about? Well, Esther knew that she needed to go before the king to get his favor. But the king had made this rule up that no one comes before me uninvited or you're probably going to get executed. And if you come before me, you come bursting in my doors uninvited, you're, you're probably going to the gallows. Unless I happen to be in a good mood and I extend my golden scepter in your direction. And if that happens, then you have my favor. You can come in and we can talk. And if you have a request, we can talk about that. So that's what Esther was talking about. She understood uh, the consequences. And so uh, she approached the king. And he noticed her out there. In fact, I'm, I'm going to read that. Uh, see if I can find that here. Just want to read that part. On the third day, Esther put her royal robes on and stood in the inner court of the palace in front of the king's hall. The king was sitting on his royal throne in the hall facing the entrance. And when he saw Queen Esther standing in the court, he was pleased with her and he held out the gold scepter that was in his hand. So Esther approached and touched the tip of the scepter, and the king asked, What is it, Queen Esther? What is your request? Even up to half the kingdom, and it will be given to you. I mean, she hadn't even opened her lips to make known the request. He says, Hey, up to half the kingdom, whatever you want, it's up to you. It's, up, it's yours if you want it. How many know that's favor? Yeah, you know, I was reading this story, though. I had this thought. I don't know how the, I get these thoughts every once in a while, that maybe I ought to get myself one of those golden scepters. And when I'm sitting on my throne at home and my kids, one of my kids come up and they ask, they, they want to ask me, you want to come into my presence and ask me for something, if I don't extend that golden scepter in your direction, <laughs> yeah, that's probably get me in trouble if I do that, right? You know, the end of the story, God brought great deliverance to the Jews and Haman who was plotting their execution, was exterminated, executed. Now, his head wasn't cut off. You know what they did? They impaled him on a sharp stick. This was, that was this king's favorite method of, of executing people, is impale them on a sharp stick. I don't know if they put a stick in the ground and then dropped them from like a two-story building or what. I don't know. It's kind of gruesome to think about. But anyway, that was his demise. Psalms 5.12 says, Surely, Lord, you bless the righteous. You surround them with favor as a shield. I don't know about you, but the more I read and study about favor, I want it. I want God's favor. And God wants to give you favor with people to achieve your goals, to accomplish your destiny, to make advancements in your life. And one of the ways that that happens is through prayer and fasting. Just an up-to-date illustration about this. Bobby, you know, we've been building this addition, and uh, there are several countertops out there that needed or excuse me, several cabinets that needed countertops. And so we explored different ways to put countertops on there. We looked at Formica, that's probably the cheapest, and went all the way up to granite and some of those harder stones. And we, we were just comparing prices. We want to be good stewards of every dime that, that comes in here. And so Bobby went out to a, a local granite place. I think it's called Gorge Granite. Is that what it's called? Give a little advertisement there. And... Uh, she began to talk to him about the needs and ask if he'd come up and measure and, and just give a quote. Well, over the process of time, he began to give her prices that are far below 
the price that he would normally ask. In fact, when it came down to it, there's granite all over out there, and it really didn't cost that much more than Formica would have cost. And the reason is this man kept giving her these crazy good prices. And he even donated some of his labor, didn't he? Did he don't? Yeah, I think he donated some of his, his labor, did some things for free. And he kept saying, I don't know why I'm giving you these prices. <laughs> well, I know why. It's called favor. Well, here's a fourth benefit, personal revival and renewal. The fourth benefit of prayer and fasting. One of the things that we have to deal with as Christians, like it or not, is a, what I call spiritual drift. Spiritual drift. There is a constant pull from the world, from the flesh, our own bodies, our own flesh, and the devil to pull us away from God, to pull us away from a first love, intimate, passionate relationship with God, an all-out, fully surrendered relationship with him. That's something that every single one of us have to deal with. I don't care what title is behind your name, what job you do. And I'm sure that all of us can, to, can look back in our lives and we see seasons of spiritual fervency. Man, you were hungry for God. You couldn't wait to have devotions in the morning. You loved reading the Bible. You wouldn't shut up about Jesus in the marketplace. Everywhere you went, you were sharing Jesus in the, in, to the bank teller, to the gas station attendant. You were on fire for God. But I bet you can look back on your life and see seasons when uh, you weren't all, in, all that interested in things of God. Bible reading was hard. Prayer was boring. You didn't have any motivation to even come to church. What had happened? You had drifted away. Did God move? Did God go somewhere? No. God never moved. God never changes. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. He will never move away from you. If there's been a drift, it's been on your part. And every single one of us are vulnerable to that. And we have to fight it every day because there is the world, the flesh, and the devil that is trying to constantly pull us away. The old hymn writer said it this way, prone to wonder, Lord, I feel it, prone to leave the God I love. Can anybody relate to that? Fasting, however... We'll bring a course correction to that spiritual drift. We're going to look at, I think, one more scripture here. Joel chapter 2. It says this. Joel had, had called a corporate fast again. He says, even now, declares the Lord, return to me with all of your heart, with fasting and weeping and mourning. Rend your heart and not your garments. Return to the Lord your God, for he is gracious and compassionate, slow to anger and abounding in love. He said, return to me with all of your heart. Return from where? From wherever you have drifted to. For some of you, man, you have drifted way off course. You're way out there. For others, it might just be a minor drift. But regardless of where you are, there is returning that needs to happen. If you drifted off course, you need a, your spiritual navigation system recalibrated with a new focus point. And that focus point is Jesus. Scripture says, return to me with all of your heart, with fasting, weeping, and mourning. How many know that God does not want a half-hearted, lukewarm relationship with his people? He wants all of our hearts, right? He wants to be the center of our lives. He wants to be the main course and not just the leftovers whenever we get around to him. So the scripture says, return to me with all of your heart, with fasting, weeping, and mourning. Fasting and prayer helps recalibrate us with a new focus and, and, and readjust that spiritual drift where we were moving away from God. Now we're moving back toward him. Now we're restoring that, that fresh fire and, and that passion for God. It got quiet in here when I started talking about spiritual drift. The old timers used to call it backsliding. You know, the 
truth of the matter is, we are either pressing into God with our whole heart, or we're drifting away from him. There is no neutral middle ground where you suddenly find yourself on the spiritual level and then you just kind of coast your way into heaven from that point on and you don't have to do much about it. No, you're either pressing in or you're drifting away. You're pressing in or you're drifting away. Where are you today? Are you pressing in? Are you drifting away? Are you passionate about the Lord? Or can you look back on your life and remember a time and recall a season when you, are, when you couldn't wait to get to church and you wondered why there wasn't church every night of the week? I love new believers because they are on fire for God. And I don't know how many times they've come up to me and, and said, Pastor, I, I, I'm going to Sunday morning, and, and I'm in the prayer meeting, and I'm in the small group, but what am I going to do the other four days or three days of the week? Why can't we have church every night? I just want to hang out with Jesus. But when we're in a spiritual drift, we can't hardly make it to Sunday morning. Regular attendance these days, it used to be every week, then it drifted to two times a month. Now, for the most part across this nation, regular attendance is once a month, according to studies. And over 50% of Christians don't even pick up their Bible once a week. And the average length of prayer is three minutes a day. This is where we are as a, as a church of Jesus Christ. We have drifted away. I love it when some of these evangelists from Africa come because I'll tell you what, they don't have all the distractions. They don't have Netflix. They don't have Hulu. They don't have TV, a lot of them. They don't even have the internet. They don't have cell phones. So what do they do? They pray. <laughs> they study the Bible. They get together with one another in fellowship and enjoy God's presence. And, uh, you know, one gal that we had a few years ago, she says, the entire church meets at 5 o'clock every, every single morning, and we pray together. And then we go to work. And then after work, the entire church meets together at 6 o'clock at night, and we pray together before we go home and have dinner. You think, that's radical. I don't think it's that radical. If you read it, book of Acts, it says they got together daily. And they ate together and they fellowshiped together and they studied the word together. They couldn't wait to get together. I don't think there's anything radical about it. This, this is the norm right here. What we're experiencing in our culture is not the norm. It's called spiritual drift. It's actually called backsliding. If you want to know the truth of it. Now, I'm not pointing any fingers because we all go through it. I go through it. I go through it. I'm the pastor of the church. But there are seasons when I struggle with this. And I just don't have much enthusiasm to get into the Word. I don't have much enthusiasm to pray. And I haven't talked to anybody much lately about Jesus. And then the Holy Spirit, thank God for the faithfulness of the Holy Spirit, begins to convict me and says, you are in a spiritual drift, my son. What are you going to do about it? One of the main things we can do is just begin to fast. Begin to pray and say, God, I don't want to stay there. I don't want to, if, if, if you don't adjust the, the spiritual drift, where are you going to end up in at? You're going to be so far off course that it's going to be hard to ever get back. And I know people that way, that they drifted so far out that they can't hardly get back. They're like Esau, who though he sought repentance with tears, he could not find it. And we say, well, it can't be that easy. I mean, that hard. It is. I can't explain it. I don't understand it. But when you've been passionate with God and you've drifted so far away from him, it is very difficult to get back sometimes. Scripture says, return to me with all your heart with fasting and weeping and mourning. You know, I'm all about the joy of the Lord. I think we ought to be filled with joy and have a smile on our face. But no, I, I believe there's also a place in the Christian walk for sorrow and for weeping and for mourning. I think we ought to be sorrowful 
and we mourn when we realize how far we've drifted from God, when we realize how low he's become on our priority list. I know I'm preaching tough to you, but God's going to heal your toes if I step on them this morning. There ought to be sorrow when we realize that we made gods out of things that should never be gods, like our, our sports and our entertainment and our, our food and, and uh, even a person or whatever it might be, our social media. When we can't give that stuff up to seek God, then it has become an idol in our life. It's become more important to us. It's feeding our soul more than the Word of God, more than the presence of God is feeding us. And we need to be sorrowful about that. 2 Corinthians seven ten. and I'm almost done. Godly sorrow brings repentance that leads to salvation and leaves no regret, but worldly sorrow brings death. Repentance is a 180 degree turn. I'm walking this way, I'm drifting away from God, but suddenly I realize I'm going in the wrong direction. And so I'm making about face and I start moving toward God. I start fasting. I start praying. I make a decision. I'm going to get into the Word of God. If I need accountability, then I'm going to get some folks around me to help me be accountable, to call me in the morning. Hey, did you get up and pray this morning? Well, why not, you fool? Get up and do it. Set your alarm. I remember Chip Ingram. I, I've shared this before, but he, he was a college athlete. He's a pastor today. But... Uh, when he, when he was a young Christian, he, he, he was struggling with prayer and, and reading the Word, just having that devotional time. And so he had this roommate, I think that was a football player, big guy, huge guy. And uh, he said, let's call him Bill. He said, Bill, I need you to help me be accountable, to get up in the morning and spend that time with the Lord. And Bill said, are you serious? Or is this just some kind of spiritual, you know, gibberish? No, I'm serious. I, I mean it. I want you to... Help me be accountable. And so, well, next morning come, and the alarm went off. Chip reached over, turned off, and went back to sleep. Well, Bill heard the alarm. He got up. He walked into Chip's room, big guy, remember, grabbed him by the feet, by the ankles, picked him up, took him into the bathroom, threw him in the shower, and turned the water on. And Chip is just fuming. What are you doing, you crazy nut? And he says, well, you asked me to help you be accountable. I'm helping you be accountable. And Chip said, somehow every day after that I managed to get up, <laughs> have my devotions with the Lord. Hallelujah. Rend your heart and not your garments, the scripture said. Rending the garments was an old Jewish tradition. When they, just to express sorrow and grief and mourning, they would rip their designer clothes. Can you believe that? I'm probably, nobody be do Well, actually, they do do that. They wear, they're called jeans. They're ripping them all over the place. And that's not out of grief and sorrow. That's to look cool. But back then, they, they did it out of grief and sorrow. But how many know God's not interested in ripped clothes? He wants ripped hearts. He wants rended hearts. He wants hearts that are open to him and say, God, search me and know my heart. I've got some junk in there that's been leading me away from you. And right now, I'm saying, God, I'm opening up my heart. And I want you to come in and rearrange the furniture. Take out anything that doesn't belong. Bring me to that place of 100% surrender to you and your will. That's what we need today. That's what's so lacking. So many Christians come up, and they, they come up here. Or they raise their hands, and, and they say a prayer, and then I never see them again. Or they say a prayer, and they go on living the same kind of lifestyle. Their hearts have not been rended and torn open before the Lord. And there certainly has not been a surrender. That's what we need today. We need people who will surrender their lives to God. Hallelujah.